You know, those of you who know Mike know that this is about the tamest version of Mike Novogratz that you're ever going to <laughs> get. He true. just came from his daughter's graduation at Princeton, so he dressed up. Um, I was expecting something a little edgier, so I went and I had found orange, the, I had like the edgiest on. footwear in my closet that I could find, and, and, and look at you, you're a bore. Um, we are going to be talking about crypto. That was a great way of introducing this conversation. Uh, at some point along the way, I'm going to give you and the audience the opportunity to ask questions of Mike. I hope, uh, I would imagine you've got some burning questions because what we're here to talk about, what Mike is here to talk about, is cryptocurrencies as an institutional asset. Before we begin, let's turn again to our survey. Uh, you have the, uh, the little clickers on your chairs. I would appreciate it if all of you could participate. I've seen a lot of them sitting on the floor, so just pick it up, grab it and answer this question. Cryptocurrencies will be, A, bigger than the internet, B, disruptive, but mainly to traditional banking, C, something like digital gold, or D, a speculative fad with no intrinsic value whatsoever. So we'll wait for a moment while those entries come in. And the survey says, Ah, oh, the skeptics. <laughs> so, Mike, you've got some work we, to do. We're going to redo that survey after the 30 minutes. <laughs> so, uh, I, I don't think it's a stretch for me to guess, Mike, that you would have voted for A on that list. You know, I would have been A minus, to be fair. I, I see this crypto revolution as Internet 3.0. Uh, I mean, the Internet really did change everything about the way we live. And I do think in 15 years, we'll look back and the blockchain will have changed a ton. Uh, I'm, is it bigger than the Internet? I don't know. But it's going to be pretty darn big. A lot of crypto evangelism sounds like nonsense to traditional investors. You were, and you are still, a yes, died in the yes, wool macro guy, yes. right? You worked at Goldman, you worked at Fortress. How did you make the journey from Wall Street punter to true believer? Help people along that road. Sure, so crypto is a perfect asset to start with for a macro trader. Uh, it's a story. Right? Macro traders love stories, they love charts, they love momentum, and they like to try to think they can see the future. Um, and so when I first stumbled on crypto... Which uh, was when? This was 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, while still at Fortress. While still at Fortress, uh, right in the middle of the European financial crisis, four years after the, the big financial crises. Uh, I looked at it and I was like, well, at that point, if you remember, we had real serious investors thinking that hyperinflation was on the way. I remember Paul Singer from Elliott in Investors, one of the great greats, was wanting to put Ben Bernanke in jail for treason because he really thought he was going to inflate away the value of the dollar. Um, think about that for a second. And so you had this sense of nervousness around fiat currencies. You had this sense of distrust amongst the central banks and, quite frankly, the financial institutions. In 2008, you know, we thought J.P. Morgan was going out of business. Lehman was going. Lehman didn't go out of business. And so it felt like an easy play in that there was this amazing new technology and there was this story that we could have a distributed trust. You wouldn't need to trust the center. And so I saw libertarians, anarchists, cypherpunks, and really people that were worried about inflation all deciding this would be you know, a new, a new asset. And so I just originally bought a thing, speculative load will go higher. And so I bought it for the money. Um, we bought it, it was 96 bucks Bitcoin, and it went up to a thousand pretty quick, and that was pretty cool. Uh, it took a little while for me to dig in and really understand uh, why it's gonna be a lot bigger than a speculative asset. Well, and, and that raises an important question. There are people here, so, they might have heard a little bit of what you've had to say about Bitcoin already and, and crypto more broadly and blockchain, but they know where you come from, right? They know your background. They understand your financial DNA, if it were, as it were. Um, do you really, and I'll use that term again, do you really understand how it all works? Yeah, I'm getting close to really understanding it. So listen, there's three parts of understanding this. So what's unique about Satoshi's breakthrough, his white paper, it's almost two different Nobel Prizes. One of his computer science, uh, creating this idea of a distributed trust ledger, a blockchain itself. Uh, the computer science there is really advanced. And, and right now, one of the problems in blockchain is none of the blockchains are fast enough. 
right? They haven't scaled fast enough. And as you get more people into this distributed uh, system, it actually slows it down. And so there's all kinds of brilliant computer scientists working on fixing that scaling issue. There are a hundred different blockchains out there with a hundred different ways that they're going to fix the scaling issue. Uh, part of my thesis is that the assumption that they're going to fix it. And I, and I don't get that just willy-nilly. I was literally just at Princeton talking to the head of computer science there. And so many of the talented graduates are going into blockchain. You know, uh, all across the world, you're sucking in this talent, working on this scaling. And so part of it was the computer science. The cooler part of it, in lots of ways, is this idea of token economics. It's using a token as an incentive mechanism to quickly create social networks where people are pulling in the same direction. And that opens up all kinds of new business models that we hadn't had before. And so you put those two things together, it is a very powerful uh, force. The problem for anybody who even takes a mild interest in this is that getting up to speed, getting to where you are now, takes work, right? You started investing in Bitcoin in 2012 or 2013, and I know you got serious sort of in the early 2016 time frame, and here we are, it's mid-2018. You've been spending a lot of time on this. Indeed. And still, you acknowledge that you don't quite get it all. Well, one thing to remember that this is a third grader. Right, the Ethereum project, which was really the kind of leading project in the kind of what I call blockchains right now. It's got a lot of competition, but it's the kind of the, certainly the market leader. Uh, it's three years old. And so we're dealing with a toddler, a uh, third grader, or maybe a toddler, not a third grader. Um, and so, you know, when you try to hold to the standard of a PhD student, it's not going to work. And so a lot of this. So these still, people don't. You don't have to understand it that well I think to, you have to, to participate. I think you have to understand the big picture that there is a, a computer science breakthrough that's that's changed the way we we will all do databases. Every single database, or almost every single database, fifteen year fifteen years from now will be a blockchain. Now, they might be private blockchains where you're running them in your own company, but it's a more effective way of organizing data. The the the. The revolutionary stuff are these utility tokens or the token economics. And that really just takes a little bit of, you know, fleshing it out with your guys, business models. Does that business model make sense? What's been interesting is because it was such a mania, and remember, it was a 98% retail mania the last two and a half years. Uh, institutions weren't in it. Uh, that you didn't really need to understand how the, the, the tokens worked. People were buying in because they bought the hype. Uh, and so you had this market go way up and then crash. Uh, I'm pretty convinced for the next leg of this market, which is coming, you're going to really have to understand how the tokens work. And they work differently in every single different system. I want to make one point, which is that it sounds, and, and to some of you, it may seem like it's easy for Mike to look back on what happened in the second half of 2017 and say it was a retail mania. He and I spent much of time, much, much time talking during that period. And he said at the time that it was a retail mania. So uh, you're, it's not like you're redefining history there. Um, on the subject of token economics, one of the barriers to, I'll call it, crypto acceptance right now is the dearth of use cases for token economics. And on the flip side, many of the use cases that have been proposed but haven't yet been implemented sound like solutions in search of a problem. Well, that's a little unfair. So to, to start with... <laughs> it's my job to be a little unfair. It is. It is. To start with, I, I said earlier, the, the blockchains themselves are really these giant shared global supercomputers that are there to process data uh, that you want on the database. None of them are fast enough for industrial strength yet. Uh, we had one that just got started, or is just starting literally as we speak, called EOS. It was a project that raised money for a year, and that will probably be the first fast blockchain. Uh, its critics say it's not as decentralized. There's some trade-off between how fast something can be today and how decentralized it is. Uh, but we'll start seeing projects built. And so up until now, projects like Funfair, which is going to try to disrupt online casinos, are, has been just a story. In the last month, there have been three or four projects that have literally just started, started their test cases. So Funfair is one. Gollum, which is a, a computer processing uh, 
uh, ICO is another. Uh, I think Augur is starting to, to do things. And so we're just at the very first step of seeing some of these disruptive business models come into, but they're really not going to be here for another 18 months. Really? Yeah. It's going to take that long. And so, you know, most likely, listen, we had a retail bubble that popped, and now we have institutions that are marching slowly but surely towards acceptance. Markets always get way ahead of reality. That's just the way it works. This is such a powerful story. And some of these potential disruptors are so powerful in such big industries that my gut feeling is institutional money is going to come in soon and markets are going to get way ahead of the reality again. We'll get to that in a moment. While we're on the token economics part in the blockchain, if you look at potential applications for this technology, acknowledging that we're 18 months away from something real and viable, in which industries do you think crypto has the most promise as an enabling technology? So anywhere where there's a social network uh, with simple, Uber, I, I keep using Uber as an example, right? What does Uber do? It matches drivers and riders. There's a social network, a peer-to-peer -peer matching system, drivers and riders, and it sits in between, and it provides a billing service and a map, uh, surge pricing, and charges 25 to 30%. Like, that is so ripe for a decentralized system to come in and at least compete with it. Now, Uber's not going to roll over and play dead. They're going to fight back. But, you know, it's a perfect use case. Uh, and what's interesting is the way the token in a theoretical decentralized Uber works, it's not equity. It literally is a future on what a ride would cost or how many rides can you get for one token. And so when drivers and, and riders and engineers and speculators own that token, they all want it to go the same direction. As more and more people use that service, as they take Dubers instead of Ubers, decentralized Uber, um, <laughs> As they use that service and ridership grows, more and more become speculators in that token. And so the token starts feeling like equity, even though it's not equity. Uh, it's a really interesting use case because here's a company, one of the fastest growing companies in the history of the world, and an amazing company lots of ways. Uber, it's changed the way we've all maneuvered around cities. Uh, and even before it goes public, there's a threat that's coming. And again, it's not coming this year. It's coming two to three, four years down the road before everything gets scale. Uh, but it's coming, I'm 100% certain. Even if investors, institutional investors, get over the acceptance hump, they understand what crypto is, they understand how a blockchain works, they buy into this notion of tokenized economics, there's a whole other set of barriers to institutional ownership. Um, and we should talk about that. Custody is probably at the top of the list. Yeah, well, let's start with the fact that Bloomberg got over the fear of being in the crypto space. Like, that's a big deal, right? You guys are a, a, a mainstream, big, you know, giant financial market media company with a management committee that probably isn't as young as, you know, as me. You know, <laughs> like most big management committees, you're older. And in general, older people have had a harder time understanding this, sh this shift, right? Even the idea of digital gold makes a lot more sense to my 24-year-old than it does to my 84-year-old dad. Uh, and so we're seeing institutions make, make a move. Having this index is important. I was thinking about other places that started index. The S&P 500 came out in 1962, and if you look at the price of stocks from 62 onwards, they kind of went straight up. Uh, Lehman had its first fixed income in index in 72, and then the Lehman Ag, I think, was like 82. Uh, and if you look at what happened in the fixed income markets from the mid-70s straight up, it's literally been one direction. I was at Goldman Sachs in 1992 when Goldman launched the Goldman Sachs Commodities Index. Up until then, people speculated in commodities just like they speculate in crypto, but no institutions had bought commodities as part of their portfolio. Goldman came out and said, hey, this should be part of your institutional portfolio. It's uncorrelated. These are the reasons. If you look at commodity prices from 1992 to 2008, man, you wish you owned a lot. And so this index, maybe we're six months early, maybe we're two years early, but crypto will be an asset class. Uh, institutions will move into it. Custody is coming. I'm speaking to four or five major uh, 
traditional custody players that are all working on figuring out how they're going to get involved. There's been enough money made and enough, and enough research done and enough people moving into this industry that every institution, if there's been one surprise to me in the last eight months, it's when I go to the New York Stock Exchange or to Deutsche Bank or to Goldman Sachs. Their senior people know so much more about crypto than I thought they would. They are doing their work and they are getting ready to pull the trigger. Uh, and so we are going to see announced in the next three to six months, three to nine months, an institutional custody solution. Now, what's interesting is the custody, custody solutions today actually are probably fine, but they're run by companies like Zappo and BitGo and Kingdom Trust. And generally, if you're sitting at the state of Wisconsin and you're going through that form, are you going to risk your career on something that says Zappo? No, you actually want it to say, you know, State Street. And so, ironically, we're going to need kind of a step back to go forward. We're going to need trusted custodians to hold these keys. But I'm telling you, that's coming, and I'd be shocked if you don't see it by year end. Whether it's State Street or Goldman Sachs. My or... own hunch is it's going to be some consortium, right? Because the consortium gets you close enough, and then the one firm isn't betting the, betting the ranch. Because these, these are bare instruments. Someone robs the bank, ooh, that would suck. Uh, but custody is only part of it. Does a, for these people and others who are thinking about crypto from, an inst from the standpoint of an institutional mindset need, again, I'll say a Goldman or a JP Morgan or a Morgan Stanley or whomever, pick your uh, established financial institution, do they need an organization, a company like that, to offer a full suite of crypto services to get them comfortable. You know, I think that's coming. And so listen, we started Galaxy because I was like, let's let's help credentialize this space and let's get in front of that, that wave. As a pure crypto company, you have less at risk than Goldman Sachs or Jeffries or, or you know, even the second tier players. And so we thought that's our competitive edge. I was originally saying we're going to build the Goldman Sachs of the space. And now I know this is going to get myself in trouble, but I was like, it's actually more like Drexel. If you think about what Mike Milken and his guys did, they helped credentialize junk bonds, you know, high yield as an asset class. They were the proselytizers, the traders, uh, the bankers, and that's what we're trying to do. I tell you, the, the, the rest of the guys are coming. Goldman Sachs has set up a trading desk, and they're starting to trade NDFs. They will trade the coins themselves as soon as they get a custody solution. Uh, I know lots of the, what I'll call second tier, they'd hate to be called second tier, so that's probably not the right word. Smaller. Smaller investment banks are looking at raising money for crypto companies, and they're trying to get around, you know, is it the right thing to do or not? But they're all having that conversation. And so for me, it's a race to actually get established, get in business, hire world-class guys, and be in, that, be in that business. There's a huge regulatory overhang. Uh, if, if I were an institution, I might ask myself, why would I want to get in front of the SEC or the DOJ right now? You know, it's a great question. Listen, I started by saying the first three years were 98% or 95% retail. Regulators don't come from retail. Their job is to protect retail, but regulators come from institutions. Right? Jay Clayton worked at uh, Sullivan Cromwell. Uh, so they're talking to the guys they knew from the Goldman Sachs's, from the JP Morgan's, the mortgage desks, if they're regulating mortgages, they call their guy. And so they missed this completely because there was no one playing on it. And so all of a sudden, it's late last year, and this goes from small market cap to all of a sudden a trillion dollars worth of you know, market cap. And you know, uh, Paris Hilton out there pitching coins, uh, and everybody in the planet talking about it. Uh, the regulators got worried. I mean, it was interesting. CNBC, not to pick on CNBC, but I think I can see them here. They literally had a show where they were one by one walking people through how to buy the Ripple, the XRP coin, literally when it was trading at $3.20, having moved from $0.20 cents eight weeks earlier. From the day of that show, the thing plummeted. Uh, we were short. <laughs> it plummeted uh, all the way back to $0.50. Cents. That, was that was peak nonsense? Peak nonsense. But the regulators had to get involved. And so they are getting involved, and they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. The first thing is, Wait a minute, let's calm things down, let's go after fraud, and let's go after market manipulation. So the first two things regulators are going for are fraud and market manipulation, and it's a good thing. Uh, the Department of Justice talked about market manipulation with these in, uh, indexes inflating their volume numbers. It's all true. 
And so we're going to knock out some of the, the crap from the system. I actually think it's healthy. Uh, there are bigger decisions to make. You know, Bitcoin is, they've already kind of said it's not a security, okay. But Ethereum, they haven't, they haven't ruled on yet. I, I, I'd bet dimes, dimes to, to, to donuts. They will say Ethereum probably was a security, but it's not anymore. Uh, and they're, gonna, they're stuck. Because they weren't ahead, there is this group of tokens that were issued, probably 2,500 in total, but in reality, probably 200 that matter, uh, that are in this kind of regulatory no man's land. And they've got to figure out how to deal with that. And they're working on that right now. My gut feeling is they're going to take it, they're going to take out a law firm, they're going to take out a token, they're going to take out some of the promoters of these things, just to say, dudes, you got to play by you got to play by the rules. But when we're talking to them about the, going forward in the future, they're very constructive at wanting to 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 see this new innovative way of financing companies, of of bringing liquidity and access to markets to the general population that they never had. We've made or you've made pretty clear that. You're a, and I've accused you of being a true believer, but you are. At the same time, you trade this stuff. Yeah. So how do you reconcile those two halves of your brain? On the one hand, the part of Mike Novogratz who says, I believe in this stuff, it's going to change the world to a degree, maybe not as much as the internet, but a lot. And then the other part of you that says, that's a screaming short. You know, gravity is still gravity, and market rules still work. And so when you see things that overnight go from an idea to a billion and a half dollar market cap, you're like, these guys have only hired three people. Like, that doesn't make sense to me. You know, it's probably doesn't make sense. Uh, and so it's using the same rules and understanding of market psychology that I learned over 30 years in applying them to this new market. The ballet um, of the charts? It's the ballet of the charts. Uh, it's also just being, you know, disciplined. Uh, listen, sometimes you make mistakes. You know, I, I owned a whole lot of Ethereum and it started rallying a lot and I was like, this is kind of crazy and I started selling some maybe too early. But broadly, uh, it has benefited me and our, our organization. Uh, to keep taking ships off the table, to, to trade extensions and, and pullbacks, um, to really do work on which companies or which, they're not really even companies, they're ecosystems. Which ecosystems do we believe have a shot of really growing and sucking people into them? Because for a token to work, it needs to have participants. And so we'll go long the ones we think are gonna be able to build communities and short the ones we think where they're not gonna be able to build communities. Well, let's talk about that for a moment. There are. Most of the tokens that you can see on coinmarketcap.com are would-be utility tokens. Yes. Of those, and there's 23, there, there are lots, but there are 23 as of yesterday with a market cap of a billion dollars or more. How many of those survive? So think of it in a different way. There are 100 blockchains right now. So the, right, they're, think, they're, you can think of them in three buckets. Bitcoin by itself, because I really think it's going to be around for a long time and it's going to be decentralized gold, but it will not be the blockchain that all the cool stuff gets built on. Personal opinion, but I'm pretty certain I'm right. Uh, then there's 100 blockchains, these supercomputers that are going to process that everything's going to get built on top of. There's no need for 100 blockchains. That will go down to five, three to five. Now, 40 of them are in China alone. Uh, so let's say 60 non-Chinese. Uh, three to five. And those will probably be based on some difference in how centralized they are. Uh, how, how, how secure do you need your project to be? Do you need 18 inch bulletproof glass or 36 inch bulletproof glass? Uh, and the market's gonna sort that out. But you don't need 100. And so a lot of those will either go to zero or will be, there will be a merger, they'll, they'll combine. I'm not positive how that plays out, but it's gonna be really interesting to watch. Your best guess right now, which of the three to five? I think Ethereum and EOS are, are, are both really interesting projects. I think uh, Telegram, which hasn't even started yet, is something you've got to watch, right? They raised $2 billion. They have 210 million users. Uh, they've got a world-class CEO and his brother, who's a world-class engineer. Uh, remember, these blockchains are open source. So they can say, you know, we're starting tomorrow and we're going to take Ethereum, the Ethereum blockchain, and start from that. And they're collaborative. And so it really is, can you build a community? 
Well, they've already built a community of users, and can they build a community of developers? And the question would be, with the, with the $2 billion, it gives them a shot. One of the reasons I think EOS has a shot, they have a five to $6 billion war chest. So these aren't like small little companies anymore. Like five to $6 billion in, in the war chest gives you a lot of oomph to attract people to build your ecosystem. Is there one you're more, most bullish on? In the short run. EOS? EOS, yeah. EOS. Um, you predicted, Mike, when we spoke back in September, the crypto, and again, just to sort of keep things real here, we talked about this in a, in a sort of a big way for the first time back in September. And at the time, Bitcoin was at, in the 4,000 neighborhood. Uh, and he predicted that crypto, broadly speaking, was going to be going to be the biggest bubble of our lifetimes. Was that the December bubble, or does no. that bubble have yet to happen? That was 96, uh, not even 99. And so it, you think Hang about on it a this, second. Say that again. That was 1996 internet, 19, not 1999 internet. So here, let me just give some, some metrics. The total market cap in January, if you add in coins and private companies and everything else, was probably a $1.2 trillion, right? Hold that thought. That's $2,018. The internet bubble in 1999 got to six trillion before it crashed to one trillion. So take 1999 dollars, think what an apartment in Toronto or, or New York or, or Tokyo cost in 1999 versus today, right? Probably two and a half to three X. Uh, take the fact that this is a global revolution, right? In the internet bubble, you only really could buy if you were, it was only a US thing. It was rich U.S. people participating in there, you know, upper middle class to rich U.S. people participating. This is global. There are kids in Bangladesh buying coins. It is monstrous in Tokyo and in Korea and in China and in India uh, and in Russia. And so we've got a global market, a global mania. And once institutions come in, that one and a half trillion is going to look small. This will feel like a bubble when we're 20 trillion. And it's going there. And it'll go there. And it won't go there right away. It'll go there because what's going to happen is one of these intrepid, you know, uh, pension funds, you know, Texas teachers, state of Wisconsin, the Canadian pension, somebody who's a market leader is going to say, you know what? We got custody. We got Goldman trading it. The story, I believe, Bloomberg's involved. They've got an index I can track my performance against. Uh, and they're going to buy. And all of a sudden, the second guy buys, and then you hit the tipping point. In the same FOMO that you saw in retail, because people are going to be like, this is, I mean, it's, it is real technology, and they are going to try to disrupt almost every industry, from cloud, cl cloud computing to Airbnb to, to Uber, uh, forgetting the other side of the token game, which are more less exciting but just as powerful, securities tokens, where we're going to fractionalize art. Or we're gonna we're gonna sell mini shares in real estate, and so uh, you know there's just so many innovations that this opens up that are coming. That animal spirits will get the best of investors again, and the market will get ahead of the reality. So on that uber optimistic note, <laughs> duper optimistic note, if you prefer, yes. should we open it up to a few questions from Love the floor? To. Uh, raise your hand. We'll get you a microphone right here. Yeah. And Sorry. if you don't mind, just identify yourself so that Mike knows uh, who he's talking to. Yeah, hi, Elliot uh, Trexler uh, with Global Return Asset Management. I, full disclosure, don't own any cryptos, but I follow it very closely. I uh, read a lot about them, actually, in some chat groups, and so I'm, I sort of feel like I'm neck deep in the research. I still can't wrap my mind around how, and I'm asking you to explain, uh, how cryptos are different from, as an extreme example, used tennis shoes. The idea being, or a used couch, the idea being that it's really only worth what somebody else is willing to pay for it, whether that's in a closed network business system, and how that is still going to replace uh, uh, monetary currency, considering the volatility that exists with cryptos. So, so A, I don't think it's going to replace monetary currency. Uh, I really think where you're going to see cryptos have a, its big, big impact is taking out the rent takers, right? So if you think about the Uber example, Uber's a rent taker. If you think about the entire entertainment industry, right? I was giving a, a, a talk to this conference of 80 of the biggest bigwigs in, uh, in media, and I was thinking to myself, I was like, you know what? You guys sit between the talent and the consumer, and crypto's coming after you. Uh, the guy asked me, he was like, why did I invite you for this thing? You just insulted all my clients. Um, 
I really think that's the, the, where you're going to see the big disruption. Uh, governments can throw you in jail and they can fine you, and they're going to be very loath to lose control completely of their monetary policies and, and, their, and their currencies. And so I think where you're going to see regulation focus is on the currency side. Um, you know, privacy coins are something that regulators and banks are really, really dislike. I'm not saying they will go away, right? But they're not going to be allowed to operate freely in the, the current uh, regime. And I don't see the re regime really changing. Uh, but no regulators care about competition if we're going to go after Airbnb uh, in a decentralized version. And so I think, you know, sometimes the focus on currency is a little misled. Listen, gold doesn't necessarily have a lot of use cases other than, than uh, jewelry, but it's, it's worth something because we say it's worth something. Uh, Bitcoin can be worth something just like your used tennis shoes because there's a, well, in Bitcoin there's a limited supply. There seems to be an unlimited supply of used tennis shoes because they make them every day. Uh, but you've got a limited supply and people are starting to say, hey, there's a store of value. There are 600 million under 25-year-olds in India. That's two Americas. Uh, right? The world is young and growing fast. Uh, young people are much more comfortable in a digital world than old people. Right? They grow up in their phones. Uh, if you look at the League of Legends Super Bowl that was played in the bird's nest last year in Beijing, 80 million people watched it on TV. That's like that's more than the NBA game sometimes, uh, League of Legends Super Bowl. And so this digital world is coming so fast. I use the example all the time, and my, my IR people laugh. They said, you got to get a new example, but I like this one. You know, when I gave my mom digital flowers for Mother's Day, she slapped me. But, <laughs> but when my daughter gets digital flowers from her boyfriend, she's like, oh, he loves me. Um, you know, we're, it's a different world. And so the idea of digital gold is so much easier for a young person to understand than a guy with no hair or gray hair. Um, but it's, that's coming. Uh, so I gave you kind of two different answers uh, to two different parts of the ecosystem. Uh, more questions? There's one, uh, there one over here? Yeah, we'll go over here if we have one. <clears throat> Very simple question. Seems like the barriers to uh, start up a new Bitcoin or a similar Bitcoin seem seem low. Is that your uh, perception as well, too? Well, the barriers to start a new like new idea have been low, um, but they're getting higher because you can start something, but it won't succeed without community. And so the barriers to building community are getting higher. And so, quite frankly, we're looking at investing in you know, tokens or ecosystems that have resource, that have reputation and resource and, and participants. Uh, so you're going to see some big names in the next six months uh, that you've all heard of moving into the token world or the blockchain world. And I think those projects are pretty interesting because they already have community and they have resource. Um, right now, it would be really hard to start a new blockchain to compete against the other 90. There are some people doing it. If you have enough reputation, if you have uh, you know, uh, enough expertise and a brilliant idea, you'll still get funding. One thing that's really interesting uh, is right now the coins are kind of going sideways. You know, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down, and literally just chopping around. But underneath the coins, people moving into the industry, it's a straight line up. You know, job applications, straight line up. Uh, and private investing, the private rounds, straight line up. Part of that is that Sand Hill Road, you know, the, the, the great venture capital community of America, really missed chapter one. Mark Andreessen did it. He was involved. Fred Wilson was involved. I'm sure some other people were involved in a smaller way. But broadly speaking, they didn't participate. And every deal now is getting funded by venture capitalists. And so maybe it's FOMO that they missed the first round. Maybe they're seeing something. These guys are not stupid guys. They're some of the smartest investors you know, of their generation. They are all now investing in this space. And so you, you actually have much more uh, firm prices in the private rounds than you do publicly. Next one. Sure. Hi, I'm uh, Joe Rosen. I'm a professor at Manhattan College uh, Business School and former CIO at Highbridge Capital many years ago. So you mentioned stupid. Forgive the stupid question. I just don't understand how any kind of token cryptocurrency is going to disintermediate Airbnb, Uber. I, I don't follow the logic of where 
I mean, you're going to replace drivers, you're going to replace the company. I mean, how, so how is take, that going to work? Let me take you through the Uber, just an example in a really simple world. So I hired a guy from Highbridge who was also skeptical, uh, who was my CIO. And so let's assume me and Chris Ferraro, my guy, decide let's, Uber's got these 25 to 30% margins or they're charging that fee. Let's go after Uber. So we get together and we put a business plan and we say, okay, we need money. We need $30 million at least to, to hire the engineers to build the matching system to put this decentralized version of Uber on the, the blockchain. So we do an ICO and we sell some tokens and we raise this $30 million because we hire someone like Eric who hypes it up for us. Uh, he's, now moved to, <laughs> he's now moved to investment banking. And so we build, we build on top of, let's say we pick the Ethereum blockchain or the EOS blockchain, we build a matching system. Uh, on this blockchain. We say, take some of the money and we start advertising the same way Uber did. Hey, use Uber. Uh, we incent drivers. Uh, we give them some tokens. We give riders some tokens. And all of a sudden, the project starts. Now, it's open source. And so the community of developers uh, can try to make it better. There's a whole constitution on um, how you would change things. Those tokens represent a ride. It's a future sale of a ride. And so all of a sudden on day one, you go onto your phone. You're not going to pay in tokens in your mind. It's going to be 8 bucks instead of 12 bucks. It's going to be cheaper. So you're going to say, I'll take it. And you'll have a nice app on your phone just like you do now, but it'll say Duber instead of Uber. And maybe the first ride is going to cost 8 bucks, which will be one token. And so you'll either buy your token or you use your token. But it's 8 bucks, And it'll instantly convert it. Uh, as more and more people want to ride, the idea is that riders and drivers will hoard some of those tokens. They'll all f function as speculators, you want to think about it. So if I've got a fixed supply of tokens and more and more people start hoarding just little pieces of them, the price of the token goes higher. The price of the token starts to feel like an equity. Hey, so, but it doesn't change the, rider, the driver's business model. He still has inputs. Right, you know, gas, car payments, insurance, you know, those are his cost and his revenue are going to be. He gets paid in these tokens, which he instantly can convert to cash, or he can convert some of it to cash and keep some in tokens. And so, why does it work? Because all of a sudden, the driver and the rider, they feel like owners. And so, it's like an Amway sales, sales force. Hey, use Duber, don't use Uber. Uh, you have everyone in the system has a vested interest to get more people in the system. And so you're using this token to create the social network and you do it fast. And we, and we see in small scale how this works. And so this is the big experiment that you're going you're gonna to see. You're going to see it play out live time over the next two to four years where you're going to see some of these systems either work or not work. But we've seen big open scale projects work in the past. And this is open scale with an incentive mechanism. Mike? Uh, I'm afraid, folks, that we don't have time to continue. I know that we could. We could talk probably for another half hour and answer questions. Uh, I want to thank Mike Novogratz for being here. A round of applause, please.